Welcome everybody to uh, part two of Alan and Bayrav's Fireside Chats. My name is Bayrav Patel. I am the CEO co-founder of Atom Ventures and Atom CTO. And here we have Alan Clark. Just introduce yourself, Alan. Hi, Bayrav. Hi, my name is Alan Clark. I'm the founder of the Business Growth Partnership. And I spend my time working with small and medium-sized businesses on strategy development and marketing strategy. Oh, and you've done a good thing there. So I should say, <laughs> what we do at Atom Ventures, we work with startups, pre-seed, uh, seed startups, and also small businesses to help them with their technology, uh, give them strategic and operational advice around technology, but also support them through introducing them to people like Alan uh, around business and, and marketing in lots of different areas. So today, we are going to talk about short-termism in business. So Alan, do you want to, this is your topic, so do you want to kick off? What do you mean by short-termism in business? So, well, let me just explain why this kind of came to the fore today. I did a little blog post during the week, and it probably got the most passionate response to any blog post I've ever done. And this came out of something that has been, that was drilled into me first when I started working in the world of advertising in the late 1980s. And that was a, a very famous quote. I'm sure most people have heard it that half the money I spend in advertising is wasted. The problem is I just don't know which half. And variously that gets attributed to a whole load of people. But the two most likely um, are an American um, retailer who went on to become the postmaster general John Wanamaker, mm. or Lord Lever, whom the guy who created Unilever and so is responsible for probably most of the cleaning and food products you have in your house. But the thing about it is it was, whoever said it, they certainly said it about 120 years ago. And it was absolutely pertinent when I started in the advertising world in the 1980s, 1990s. And what I reflected on in this post was that, is it still the case today? And really, it was less about back in those days where um, the argument was about uh, that there was no way of measuring the effectiveness of advertising. And the point I was making in this day of digital media was there are so many ways of measuring the effectiveness of advertising. It was what does effectiveness actually mean? And what that led to was to a point of view that is effectiveness about garnering long-term benefits, long-term goals, long-term income streams, or is effectiveness or perhaps efficiency about short-termism and how quickly the money that is spent can be recycled back into the company's coffers. So one may still argue, and I hypothesize, that half the money we currently spent was wasted because it was all about the here and now, and not about generating long-term income flows, long-term revenues. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was it was an inexorable look at how quickly can I spend money and get it back in at the expense of building long-term brands. And I think what really got me was the guys of my generation who have been around in this world and been through some of the ups and downs. Without exception, every single one of them said there is far too much focus on short-termism in this world of digital marketing because it is so easy to track short-term results at the expense of long-term benefits because it is much harder to track short-term spend into long-term results. And the other group were the people who were younger and brought up only in this world of digital marketing who said, effectively, who cares about the long term? We all live in the short term. So that really prompted what I, I, Barb and I are going to chat about this morning. My tuppence worth when I wrote that piece was, yeah, I do believe that it is the job of businesses to have a long term perspective and build value and not a short-term perspective, which is if we see ourselves through tomorrow and next week, that's all that matters. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot obviously to unpick there. I think the problem stems 
from the way that we talk about business nowadays, right? So there's that fail fast mentality. There's the hockey stick mentality, right? So yeah. investors want to see this hockey stick growth and how quickly can you do it? And you want to, you know, you want to test your product out in the market as quickly. And if it's not working, go and do something else. And I think, but I think that exists in a certain world, right? And in that world, everything is measured from, you know, what's your, how many customers did you get this month? How many customers did you get uh, next month? How long are they going to be? And that's, that's in that new tech startup world. And that's in the one, those, I think that world where, you know, a lot of well, where, I, where I work and where you work is, is it just, in, they're all ingrained into, if you, if you don't have a result by uh, the next month, then you've failed. I mean, a great example of this is the, the, the grant applications for Scottish Enterprise, right? That you have to put in there how much you're going to see over the next year, six months, right? But actually, the, the stuff that you do may not come until year two. And no one's really thinking about that. Everyone's kind of, everything is measured on the short-term basis. And, um, and so I think that's what the culture has, has grown into. But I also think, you know, when it comes to the youngsters is that, you know, their attention is just going to move quickly, right? Again, we've, that, I blame MTV for this, but, you know, we've all, kind of got, we've all got into that, you know, psyche where we, we, we have to be constantly distracted. But I don't think people think long-term anymore. I just don't think that people... Which is odd because if you think of the big businesses like Facebook, Google, you know, Tesla, SpaceX, whatever it is, they, they started off thinking long term. They knew that they weren't going to produce a car in the first X amount of months, right? They knew that the real juice is going to come further down the line. Uh, but are they still thinking long term? Or are those big businesses the ones that have gone for market capitalization and they are forced to think short term? Because if you're the CEO of one of these businesses, people are looking at your share price and your last quarter results, and if they're not good enough, um, unless you are an Elon Musk and a, 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 a Teflon man, you'll be out and they'll put somebody else in there to get yeah. the results that they want. But Facebook's a great example of that, right? So when it IPO'd, everyone said, oh my God, this is the death of Facebook because they lost you know, 25% or whatever it was, the value yeah. straight away, and they've just grown year on year on year, right? And so if you look at it, you're not going to bet against them. And then they've acquired, obviously, WhatsApp and Instagram on the way. So they own pretty much 80% of what's going on in social media. But everyone was, that short-term thinking, you know, is basically what made people sell their shares and, and meant that they don't, they don't um, they're not thinking, you know, long-term making the money. I mean, the, there's a great example now where people are saying, Warren Buffett, he's lost it. So the man who's what the third, fourth richest man on the planet, and oh yeah, he's lost it. He doesn't understand it. The man hasn't lost it. I mean, how, what are you talking about? And I think this is the this is the issue that everyone is that yeah, no one really wants to believe in the long term, right? And uh, no one's having, no one's thinking of legacy. Whereas I think years back, like at least my parents' generation, they're thinking about a legacy, what what they're going to leave behind to the next generation, um, so that they can actually have a better life than the previous one. Uh, I, 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 uh... As I say, I read a great um, piece about Warren Buffett who was saying, I have a major problem. Apple is far too valuable, and as a result, it's far too much of my portfolio. I wish it would actually fall in value so I could take my eyes off it and look at other stuff. What a wonderful problem to have. Um, you know, I think there's a dynamic here that is that's really interesting because um, on one hand, there's the very entrepreneurial, personality-led companies like the Facebooks and the Amazons, etc., where there is as much of an investment in the entrepreneur that leads the company, that built the company, and they're able to say, look, guys, this is about the long term, and there will be ups and downs. And then there's another group, which are your more regular um public companies where the CEO is a hired hand in to do a job and they have not been brought in for the long-term view of the success of that business. They are brought in based on short-term goals around share price and quarterly and annual results. And there was a really interesting article because when this started coming up I thought, what do I really know? So I did a bit of research on it. And there was a really good report by EY in 2014, where um, it basically said that looking particularly at public companies, that this focus on performance and CEO performance and leadership that was measured by quarterly results and share price meant that there was no incentive 
to have a long-term view. It was all about maximizing short-term results. And if you were the CEO of one of these large businesses, and you took a long-term view, it was a one-way street to be sacked because you wouldn't be able to outperform the market in the short term and you wouldn't be a star. And that's where these guys are almost forced to have a short term view. But what that report really interestingly led into was that started at the top and then trickled entirely through these businesses. So that every level of management, you were never rewarded for where you took the business in two or five years' time. You were out if you didn't deliver short-term results. And depending on what that short-term result was, would depend on what your next target was. So they were institutionally driven to only have a short-term perspective. So, so this, okay, okay, I'm gonna ask an interesting question after I make a quick point. So the, on that whole CEO thing, they, were, they did a study and I think the average uh, life expectancy of a, of a Fortune 500 or 50, 500 CT, CEO is something like uh, just under three years, right? Yeah. That's, so, that's exactly what yeah, you are reporting. Yeah. And so, so then the question then becomes is have we, has business become like the Premier League, right? Where essentially, you know, managers are lasting for, what is it, 18 months or something like that at one point? Yeah. I can't remember the statistic, but it was ridiculously horrendous. So you've got the, everyone talks about Alan Fer Alex Ferguson and, you know the great things that he's done and then we look at generations past of you know past liverpool managers but they had 12 15 years to do stuff right and they they were terrible at the beginning right but you you would never get them now and i know that's a whole different debate but are we is that is that has that kind of whole mentality now crept into business um yes i know absolutely at that level and that kind of organization that one might say has become a victim of its own position, which is around, well, actually what we are here to do is deliver short-term returns to shareholders. And it's got the eye of the long-term. And here's a thought I have, because really most of the work that we do is in the SME space. So they're small businesses, they're not really these large organizations. And kind of how I see it playing out is, I absolutely get that in the very early stage business, and the micro business, there is no point in worrying too much about precisely where we'll be 10 years from now, because if we don't get through the next six months, there wouldn't be a 10 year view. So, yeah. Let, let me, and then in those micro businesses, the really large corporations, they should be taking a long term view because they have the resources and the access to the resources. But as we all know, business goes like that, there's ups and downs all the time. Even in what looks like linear progress, there's ups and downs on it. So those organizations should be able to ride that out. And that's where you see the Facebooks and the Amazons and all of that through their history, where by most other standards, the CEO would have been fired but because they had whatever it was that made them great, the, the charisma, the chutzpa, the vision, the shareholding, frankly, that allowed them to say, well, I don't care, I've got a view here, a vision here, and we're going for it, they've been allowed to move on. Mm -hmm. But there's that other group of professional CEOs that don't have that view, they're in to run something, and they know they're only there on a temporary basis. But my real point now is, that there's a group in the middle there where the business has become large enough not to have to worry about month to month cash flow to keep afloat. And it is not yet at a point where it has been controlled by its investors and its shareholders. There's a group there in the middle where it becomes absolutely essential that is whoever is leading that business has the capacity, the ability, and the space to take more than a short-term view. I'm not saying not a short-term view, but more than a short-term view, because their job is to lead into the future. It's not just to manage the business today. So 
I did a bit of a background research just before we were having the discussion because I wanted to, because one of the, obviously one of the things that when we're talking about short-termism and, and long-term thought, thinking about company, right? We always hear that statistic that 90 odd percent, 97 percent of businesses fail, 90 percent of startups fail uh, in the first six months, whatever it is, right? So, so that's, yeah. and that's why everyone spends all the money early to see what's going to happen and then they fail fast. So I, like I did a bit of research around where that figure came from. And then I found a, I found a, um, an article by Real Business uh, and they, they were highlighting that that came from a study in 2000, in two, around 2000. So it came out quite a long time ago. It's either 2000, 2010, it's definitely over 10 years ago. And that was about three and a half thousand tech internet businesses. So that's what all it surveyed, a small, like, small number of yeah. businesses, and that's what they found. And that number is just everywhere you go, 97% of businesses fail or whatever it is, right? That's what it is. Yeah. So these guys did some research. And what they found is that number of companies that make it to their fifth birthday if you break it down by the if you break it down by the size of the business actually 42 percent of micro businesses 45 percent of small businesses and 51 percent of medium-sized businesses make it to their fifth birthday right, right. however only 15 percent of large businesses so people companies that had over 500 uh, employees only 15 percent make it to their to the fifth birthday and i interviewed a guy called rich rusikov who uh, he's been in the business 45 years and he worked at inc.com and he cited to me that they used he was there building the inc 500 uh, list and he said that once they compiled that list off as soon as they compiled that list and started tracking the businesses 70 percent of those large businesses didn't exist after two years of being on that list so which kind of again emphasizes the fact that the larger you are the more likely you are to collapse Right. Whereas the smaller you are, the more I would say maybe it's the more agile you are. Or maybe it's the fact that a lot of these micro and small businesses are exactly that. They're lifestyle businesses. Right. And people, when they need to fund a lifestyle, are going to think differently than if you're there on a, a three years time and uh, just trying to right. create shareholder value. And uh, I think that's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Um, I, those large businesses that weren't there five years, was it that they collapsed or was it that they were maybe consumed by another business? It just said that they failed and they'd failed. And I'd assume that they, right. there's, a, I didn't get the reasons for failure, but of course there's lots of understanding around reasons why businesses fail. Right. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, and I think, uh, well, again, I, the, what it kind of tells me is that you get to a certain size of business, right. And then it loses, maybe it loses its own cohesion, right. Small yeah. businesses can be very cohesive, right. Because you know, you're all fight, you're going for a certain thing, whereas large business suddenly lose their vision and they suddenly lose. Uh, and then some, politics becomes bigger. A bigger and, issue. And is that where um, the potential for external factors in the leadership, i.e. investors or debt holders becomes more of an issue and they're looking for their short term rather than rather than being willing to trade off, you know what, we're not going to earn much money for the next 12 months, but it'll put us in a far better position. Could be, but I, I actually think, right, so if, if, you, if I look at my friends during this COVID period, right, uh, and talking to generally to people, there are obviously going to be some winners and some losers during this period because it's just a crazy pandemic. But when, you, when you're looking at the businesses that are thriving now, they tend to be smaller businesses that are easily able just to adapt what they're doing. Yeah. So for example, a delivery business, like, a, okay, I know the delivery, food delivery business is always going to kind of succeed now, but they only succeed if the restaurants succeed, right? And yeah. what they're seeing is a huge growth in, in restaurants because restaurants can suddenly, because they're small, can say, okay, I'm not going to get, uh, people coming in drunk to eat my fish and chips so I'm going to go uh, and, but, they're, but they're still going to be at home drunk right so I'm going to yeah. deliver to them when they're drunk so those ones, and you can do that you can, you can move a, a small small ship relatively easily but you can't move yeah. the tankers as quickly right there's big big monoliths and I think yeah. that's the problem is that you end up as you grow and you get bigger it becomes more of a vanity project after a while right after a certain point in time, it becomes bigger. You want to grow, you want to buy, get more debt so you can do more things, have big offices. And, and you, you kind of wonder, I mean, there's a lot of companies you see out there that suddenly have, who are shed, shedding 10,000 staff or 15,000 staff. And you're thinking, well, what were these 15,000 people doing? Right. So does that follow through to the, um, those, some of those large businesses, although perhaps maybe most of those large businesses that are in trouble right now, actually, we're in a lot of trouble before COVID, and this is just highlighted the issue. But even there's a lot of very large businesses that are doing very well right now. Yeah. But they were also the ones that were primed and ready to go pre COVID, so, pre lockdown. So my question to you then becomes, because okay, COVID is a little is is very unusual in the in the grand scheme of things, but 
because it is so specific in a certain way that it's prevented people from doing business. But, you know, I guess it comes down to business resilience, something that I'm always kind of trying to talk to people about. Do you think that the larger the business, the less they become aware of the threats that they have, right? They, they think about competitors that someone entering the market or whatever it is, but they're thinking less about the broad, broader issues that you can have as a, for, for business resilience, right? Smaller business, anything, there's so many things that right. can attack you. You think I have to think so, of everything. So what you're really talking about, Leo, is like the Titanic analogy. Yeah. We're so big, we are unsinkable. Nothing yeah. can get in our way. But we're sailing the Atlantic in a, in a little sailing boat. We're going to work our way through and pick our way through the ice field really carefully. Um, I, think, I, I think you're right there. But I think the problem is the arrogance of the people that design and build Titanics and guide Titanics is we are impervious. And we're just going to motor on regardless and it doesn't matter. I do think that maybe people that captain Titanic with the mindset of a small ship and is looking to find its way through have opportunities to do that because they're really dynamic. Mm-hmm. And one can't say that guys like Facebook and Amazon and these big monoliths that we have now mm-hmm. are dynamic. They are forever doing new things and then getting rid of them if they don't work and supporting them when they do work. Mm-hmm. And look at, you know, Apple as an example, you know, Apple isn't one business, it's been about five different, entirely different businesses over the years. But that's been, or that was, and it's interesting to have a view on it now because I'm really interested to know what the next Apple looks like. Mm-hmm. That's because it, it behaved like a small dynamic business and once Steve Jobs got back in control, he was largely left just to get on with it. He no longer had, because he had to grow up in a corporate, a corporate, corporate, and that failed. And they brought back the entrepreneur and said, look, you just run it and look where it is now. Just on the Titanic analogy, what always gets me is that why were they up near the icebergs anyway? Because Titanic's, a, the Atlantic's a huge ocean. So yeah. <laughs> I never understood where it was. Because they believed that, it was unsinkable when they believed they were greater than they were and normal things weren't an issue for them. Ah, okay, so that's a good idea. Okay, so that, that's, yeah. And that's where, you know, um, some of the big corporates are in massive trouble now. You know, look at into the uh, shopping centre people that I think most of us would only ever really associate with that name that goes beside our local massive shopping centre. And we didn't really know what the into business was until you realise this was an enormous corporate that was in the world of undercover high streets. Hmm. Well, though, was that not always going to be a problem? And it took this to take what was a really troublesome business, shove it clean over the edge. I've got another little question for you and your um, technology background. I think a lot of this in this day and age is the fault of guys like you in the tech community. Because people that come from a strategic business background, and even in, in my world of those days of marketing, you know, one of the things that I remember really clearly when I was in advertising in my early days, oh, fast, car, fast cars, expense accounts, beautiful women, all the glam, and I was sent away to do a week-long course about building company value based on discounted future cash flows. And if I say when the guy, the, the tutor came into the room and explained what we would be spending a week on, every one of us put our hand up and said, no, we're on the wrong course, mate. We are here for advertising, we're not accountants. And his point was, what you need to do is not about ads and short-termism. Your job with your clients to make a real difference is to build long-term value in their businesses. So we are built around, or that generation and that role of business strategists was certainly built around the idea of build value, build steady incomes, long-term sustainable incomes. 
And then at the end of the nineties, along came the dot com boom, and everything was about the here and now, and how we could do something to become a trillionaire overnight. And if we hadn't fallen into that trap, we wouldn't have the view that has proliferated over the last 20 years. Now, actually, I'm going to do something, get an enormous short-term return, and who cares about the future? Because I'll be so rich, it won't matter anyway. So is it really that short-termism is the fault of the technology community? Well, I, don't, I think it's, if you look at it, right, where does the money come from? So right? that yes? Uh, if, well, yes and no. So I think, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think the technology community has probably facilitated it. But if you look at it, where are investors putting their money? And it's, if you look at VCs, VCs really don't give a... I mean, okay, I'm going to take a lot of shit for this. But most VCs don't really give a crap about the business. They want their returns, right? So they, their whole reason of existence is to put, pump money in, inflate the value, sell, right? Essentially, um, that's what they're, they're, they're meant to do. So the idea being that the longer... They're not like a pension fund, right? They're not looking for... 3% gains over 20 years just to keep the money in and, and evolve it because they can make 2% off a couple of billion and they're happy, right? But yep. VCs are looking to pump in 10, 15, 20 million and try and get 10, 15% returns. And so what they're looking for are or more or more, of course. Yeah. And so, and then, cause everyone is thinking about exit and whenever you talk to any startup or investors, you know, the whole point is what's your exit. Now, when my dad started his news agents, no one asked him what his exit was. The bank manager didn't say to him, so Mr. Patel, you want to, you know, you want to create, well, they didn't give him a loan, but if they had given him a loan, they would have said, do you, what do you want to create? How's your, you know, what's your, exactly everything, you know, what, what, what's your revenue going to be like? What's your profit going to be like? What are, what are you going to assets you're going to hold on balance? What are your liabilities going to be, right? No one asked those questions. Everyone asks, okay, how, what's your revenue? What's the EBITDA? What's your return? Uh, how quickly can you sell? Who are you going to sell to, right? They just think about exits. So there is no legacy building. And it was interesting. I speak to a guy called Sean Shepard, who's got Growth X Academy. You know, and they very, very much, they're the anti version of that, right? They're not, they're not, when they invest in businesses, they are there for the long haul and they want to get right people in at different stages. Because his mentality is you build a lifestyle, right? You don't think, you know, you're not thinking about what's going on ahead of you. If you want to succeed, you need to build a life. Like you have to figure out what is your motivation and what's your lifestyle, right? Going to be, that goes alongside that business that you're creating. Um, and I think the problem is, okay, dot com, all of it, all of that short termism is about making quick money and increasing the value of your capital, right? Which has happened throughout history of when you look at the like, start of the bond markets and all this kind of stuff, you look at the history of capitalism, that's what it's all about is getting, you know, that return as, as, as quickly as possible. And then well, the it's always the, been the case. Well, the I, uh, 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 of this world, not take a view, which was, I'm actually in this for the long term. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of, Way back in the day, yes, I think that's the case. So you, the 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 Rockefellers and the Carnegies, you know, they. Which was a the time that those one of those chaps said, "Half the money I spent is wasted. I just don't know which half." Yeah, and they're the ones who believe that you know when you die, you should uh, you shouldn't be dying wealthy, right? You should be dying to leave legacies. And, but that's the thing; they wanted to leave those legacies. But well, they still... both Lord Lever, him and John Wanamaker, whoever said that they both have changed the view, which was, "I'm going to carry on spending all the money." But I know I'm wasting half of it, but I do know that in the long term, it's worth it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But I still think that when you're, the people who are behind the capital, basically the people who are investing the money, they still want to see that return, right? Because they've got their own issues to deal with. They've got their, they've, they're using this money for their own, for their own personal reasons, right? Uh, and I think that, that what's happened is that the technology... It's really weird. I think technology has become a little bit like, you know, the early days of e-commerce when you could buy lots of crap from China and everyone would have, you know, just a lot of really weird tat that they'd buy because they could on the internet, right? You just buy all sorts of, you know, shower heads that would multicolor lights that come out of it and all this kind of crap that you throw away after a while. And it's in a sense of what you've got in the technology culture. It's easy to build tech. So you build it quickly. If people use it, they don't use it, they throw it away. And then maybe there's a product that comes out there, you know, that becomes the next fidget spinner that costs very little to build, but then everyone suddenly has it and then it goes away after a while because... And, and that is your perfect example of short-termism. You know, look at fidget, uh, fidget spinners and angry birds and these things that you, this is an 18-month at most lifespan. So we get in, we make share loads of money and get out, and that's good. And there will always be that. There will always be the opportunity that you need to grab if you are a true entrepreneur and say, this is not a long-term play. 
But I guess part of the question is, is there now such a focus on the short term that nobody is investing in the long term other than the Chinese? And the Chinese have done it very, very well, and they've been doing it for a very long time. But they've they've seen they obviously saw what the they saw how colonialism worked, right? And it's there by creating, giving money, developing infrastructure, embedding yourself into that into that culture, and essentially shaping it from the until they become the next British Empire and see the sun never sets on China. And I don't think actually, it has for a while, right? Actually, we are so embedded in everything that is going on that will give you. Hawaii and the 5G thing, because actually we own your power stations, we own your roads, we own your railways, and we control all of that. And the actually, Hawaii. if we don't run that, everything stops in your country. I mean, the Hawaii thing is a, is a joke, right? Because it's a, it's been embedded in 3G, 4G. So 5G now, okay, it's well, why are we now worried about it today when we didn't worry about it? You know, because it was cheap. It was cheap decent you still had ericsson and nokia providing the same things that they uh, that Hawaii were providing when it comes to switches because i did work in telcos for a while but they were just doing it at a ridiculously cheaper price because they're subsidized by the chinese government right and that was it and people it was kind of the long-term strategy of you know what let's just get ourselves out of china into the rest it's, of the world. it's 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 the you know i always point to geo in india so for those who don't know about geo geo is like um so ambani uh came up with it was the Reliance companies, Reliance is a big conglomerate in India, and Geo and Geo just gave away their phones, right? Because they just they said, okay, we want to own the telco, the telecoms market. We're going to give away our phones, and pretty much, I don't know, it's a huge number of people in India have their phones, got them, got a smartphone, cheap smartphone or a free smartphone almost. And so, what does that mean? They now control everything that people are seeing. So they have that access. You can put whatever apps, or whatever they want to put on this thing. They can, you know, promote whatever content they have, and they have a huge captive audience. But they gave yeah. it away in a massive loss making, right? But that was the idea. You make the loss, and then you push forward because you know so, further. And than the was that not a perfect example of long term thinking? Obviously, uh, but I think so. Going back to your original question around the short term or the, the point around short termism, I think the problem has become is that we've it goes a little bit back to our previous uh, uh, discussion around the commoditization of entrepreneurship, right? The commercialization of entrepreneurship. What has happened is you've got all of these, you know, pe- coaches and entrepreneur advisors and these, you know, these VC investors and whatever it is that come on, right? Who are all commercializing the entrepreneur journey. Right? And actually not adding any value to it because all of them take away a piece from yeah. an entrepreneur as you move forward. No one is actually adding to it. So I, this is, you know, Avrim was a typical example that, you know, there was not a single, except for yourself, of course, but, you know, there's, there's not many people in that chain that we worked with that were adding value to the business. They, they were taking something and claiming to add value, but not really staying in for long term to see that that value actually um, has, has materialized. What they did was they came in, did a service and then went away again. And all they and that's it. And then suddenly everyone's, it's like picking at a big carcass, right? Everyone's taking a chunk of it and then all's left is a dead, is, is like skin and bones, right? And that's yeah. it. And so, so what, what has happened is because now people have seen all this money that is out there because the investors want short-term gains. They're flying to this, just attacking it and not, and then leaving these dead bodies everywhere, like these dead carcasses everywhere and not really thinking about actually what, what is the way forward to get this business moving on a long-term basis. Mm-hmm. Um, because we talk about hourly, it's like pricing is another good example. We talk about hourly rates, daily rates, but very few people talk about value-based consulting, right? And no. we do that at Atom. So Atom, we are very much focused on the value base. We, I don't like talking about hourly rates because what do you, you, won't, you won't value what I can produce if I give you an hourly rate for it, right? That's no. just not, that's not the right thing. But I know um, so, uh, good quality consulting isn't so by the yard. Mm. It's so by the, by the challenge and the outcome. Yeah. And That's when you bring that down to, I'll have another yard of that, please. Well, yeah, it just doesn't work. So, am I right in saying then that you are agreeing with me that this view of short termism that's really proliferated over the last 20 years is entirely the fault of the tech community? <laughs> no <laughs> i wouldn't say it's the fault of the tech community because i think there's there's short-termism everywhere right it, it's tech is just the it's the it's the easy face of it right it's uh it's I, I think you're right and you know what in doing my my little bit of uh, studying around this the first article i came from was an academic paper published in 1996 
by the American Academy of Management, they said US firms are losing out to overseas competition because of short-termism. That was 25 years ago. Yeah. I think the reality of it is that short-termism has always been there and always will be there. And the companies that have really succeeded and grown great are those who haven't focused on short-termism, who have taken a longer-term view and built something of sustainable value. Uh, and, you know, I, I think a perfect thought on that is our good old British Marks and Spencers. Marks did great for a long time because it absolutely understood that it was the vast end of great quality produce and products. And then at some point they started looking at, well, we make it a little bit less good, we'll make a bit more money in the short term. And that became a vicious downward spiral that got into problems that maybe one day it will recover from, but it does seem like a bit of a death spiral right now. And another thing that I came across in this um, was a great comment by Jack Wells. It was a man that knew how to run businesses in his 20 years running General Electric. And there's a quote where he said, anyone can manage short term, anyone can manage long term. Balancing these two things is really what management is all about. And that's a man that went into General Electric and left it 20 years later, 28 times more valuable than when he moved into it. And as I looked at the world of marketing and that piece that I wrote, which was not to say, I, I think the point I was trying to make is that it's not wrong to look at efficiency and return on money invested, but that has to be with a balance and with a long-term view as well. And if all you do is look at the short term, you'll get short term answers and there might never be a long term. If you also balance up, as Jack Wells was talking about, my job is to balance short term and long term, you may actually build something more valuable. And that's where having a business that is or can act a bit more like a private company where there is not the drive that we must report every quarter on short-term results can actually help businesses grow and prosper. And in the age of, or in the stage of early stage business, there's this whole concept we'll maybe talk about another time. As you referenced earlier on, patient capital. Capital that is willing to go in and actually grow a business and not just look for a short-term flash and businesses like you mentioned there that grow quickly by some of some scale and the vast majority don't exist five years later because they never had a view in the long term. Hmm. No. Well, I think uh, it's a great commentary. We, we, I think we can leave it there because we've, uh, we've been going now for, for quite some time. And I think that if we, there's a lot still to uncover. And I think one of the only thing I would add to that really is, is around a question about why. So when you're spending that, when you're looking at what you're doing, the, the, it's, it, the why is the question, right? Are you doing this to build a short-term game or are you looking to build a brand and, and awareness and, and a long-term future for the business? So, but anyway, but yes, um, thanks for that, Alan. It's been, it's been a pleasure as ever. Yeah. And uh, I guess we will say goodbye to the audience and um, until next time. Absolutely. Our aim with this is to... We're going to get together every couple of weeks, and you're more than welcome to join us on this. Um, this is that a journey? Is that a bit pompous? <laughs> um, if there's anything that you think is of that needs to be and discussed that others would benefit from, mm. please get in touch with either by other angles. We are really looking to involve other people and all other points of view on this. And we also are aiming to come up with a, a title, a name, a theme for these. If you have any thoughts about that, do drop a little note uh, to either of us or share it in our LinkedIn messages or anything you see around these little video casts. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, indeed. 
Uh, we already have a couple of people that have expressed an interest. So hopefully in the next week or two or the next couple of next month or so, uh, we can bring them on and, and give them a grilling. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Cheers. Cheers, Renaud. See you, bye. Bye.